Good evening. Hope that you're having a great week so far. Good to see you. Good to be with you this evening. And I uh, hope that you're having a great Thanksgiving week. Maybe you're off work a little bit or out of school. Uh, but Thanksgiving is a time that we often delve into the psychology of the turkey. And what do the turkeys think about this whole thing? Uh, what did the turkey say to the turkey hunter? Quack, quack. Uh, you know, anything to avoid uh, being Thanksgiving dinner. What did the uh, mother turkey say to her disobedient children? They said, she said, if your father could see you now, he would turn over in his gravy. So anyway, I hope that you uh, end up eating a lot of turkey. Maybe you're a turkey fan for Thanksgiving, maybe not. Uh, but this is a time that we can really thank the Lord for all that he's given to us and looking forward to getting into God's word this evening. Let's bow together in prayer and ask for God's blessing on our time in his word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to take a step back and just to get a bird's eye view of our lives, of the whole world, of all of life, and see your goodness, to see your handiwork, and help us to thank you. Help us to, to live not just a week, not just a day or a week, but to live lives of thanksgiving to you. We know that we have every single day things that we don't deserve because of you. Bless our time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanksgiving is a time that we thank God for so many things. Whenever you hear the word thanksgiving, it begs that there's someone to whom we should be thankful and a lot in the world, they kind of, they want to gloss over Thanksgiving because they don't really know who they should be th thanking. Sometimes people thank the universe. That doesn't make any sense. They thank their lucky stars. Sometimes they thank each other, but they will not give glory to God. Romans 1, by the way, says that one of the reasons that humanity goes downhill is because that when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. Neither were thankful. And Thanksgiving is one of those times a year, one of those days and weeks and hopefully all of our lives that we get to recognize and acknowledge God. That is the key. God is the key on Thanksgiving. Is there anything wrong with turkeys? No. Is there anything wrong with football? No. But this is not Turkey Day coming up. This is the day that we thank God for all that he's given us. And today we're going to look at some uh, passages of scripture uh, that we can thank the Lord for, but this is just skimming the surface of what we have to be thankful for because there's so much, there's more than we could be thankful for in a hundred lifetimes. The Bible says, listen to Psalm 103 and verses 1 and 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's really the key of what we do on Thanksgiving is we make sure that we don't forget God's benefits. What a shame to go through life and to have floods of benefits and blessings from God and to forget them, to not even stop and acknowledge them. But here's what the Bible says in Psalm 40 and verse 5 about the blessings of God, that they are too numerous for us even to account. Psalm 45, it says, Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Another passage says that they're more than the sands of the sea. God's thoughts, his will of blessing toward us, his works toward us. They are more than can be numbered. So what we're going to look at here today is just a, uh, a snapshot, just skimming the surface of all God's blessings. But I want to focus on what we can be thankful for as Christians spiritually. Obviously, a lot of physical things. If you woke up this morning in a bed with a roof over your head and you had breakfast and you, know, all, you had clothes to put on, all of that... Where did it come from? It all came from God. James 1 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. You don't have anything that God did not give you. And so I want to look at three thoughts, uh, and I've entitled our message today, Past, Present, and Future. And I want to see something that we can be thankful for in each of these areas. Number one, let's look at the past. As Christians, by the way, all of this is for us as Christians that are redeemed, that are saved. Unbelievers cannot 
partake in this in their unbelieving state. Now, the moment that they believe, they can have all of this. But this is only for believers that we're going to look at. Number one, our past is paid for. Our past is redeemed. It is forgiven by God. A great thing that we can pause and thank God for at this Thanksgiving season. People often talk about the past in glowing terms. Oh, those were the good old days. And people talk about the golden age of this and the golden age of that and how things were uh, simpler and things were much better and things were wonderful in the past. But as Christians, and I'm talking about our unbelieving past before we were saved, there's not much in that past to be thankful for. By the way, the only thing that you could say about your past is that when you were in your sin, you had God looking for you. That was the best thing you had going for you. It wasn't the money or the fame or the friends or the sin or anything. In fact, all of that, the Bible says, those are things that we, we can't even be proud of. We should be ashamed of them. Everybody has skeletons in their closet, things from their past that, that they've done that they hope no one ever finds out about. God knows all of that. But in salvation, our past is forgiven. What a great, wonderful privilege. And I want to read some scriptures about this. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3 says this, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. There's a litany, there's a laundry list of things that we were involved in as unbelievers that's under the bridge now. Romans 8.21 says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I hope that as Christians, we never glorify. We never go back and glorify our past and say, yeah, I mean, I remember before I was saved, I, uh, you know, oh, it was so great. We did this and this and we partied and it was so awesome. And I mean, you know, that was the past and God has forgiven me, but oh, it was so great at the time. Don't look back and glorify that. It says, you are now ashamed of those things. We don't need, we shouldn't even be speaking of those things that we did uh, in a glorifying manner. Uh, before we were saved. The end of those things is death. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. It gives another list of pre-salvation lifestyles of the church of Corinth. It says, Know ye not, and we're going to read through verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, when he says that, the point is he's not saying that if you're doing these things or any of these things that you're not saved. He's saying the, this is the definition of the lifestyle of an unbeliever. And as believers, we should never want to go back and do those things. Don't live the same way that those that don't inherit the kingdom of God are living. So it says this, And such were some of you, but, here's the wonderful part about salvation, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We may have an embarrassing and checkered past and things that we're not proud of, things that we're ashamed of. Well, uh, I don't know why I ever did that. Uh, this was going on and, you know, I was young and stupid, whatever it may be. But the wonderful thing is that that past is forgiven. No matter what, and that's a horrible list of sins. It says, and, and such were some of you in the church, but ye are washed. And I hope that you're thankful for the washing, for the forgiveness, for the redemption that you have in, in Jesus Christ. Listen to Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. It says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I love the word all there. We haven't been forgiven some. God has forgiven us all trespasses, blotting out 
the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You see, the problem with all of those sins is that they were all contrary to us. They were all testifying to God that we deserved hell. We deserved judgment. But when Jesus came, he took all of those ordinances, that handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and he nailed it to his cross, and he's put it in the past, and he's forgiven it, and we will never stand before God and be condemned for those sins because our past is forgiven. Because of this, we don't have to live today under the weight and the burden of that guilt. Have you ever met someone that was totally defined by his past? He had done this, maybe it was uh, he had stolen this, maybe he had a criminal record, he had gone to prison, and he's haunted by his past. Everywhere he goes, he can't overcome it. It's his name. Jesus has made us free from our past, that we don't have to be defined by it anymore. We don't have to live under the guilt and weight and bondage of it. We're set free. Psalm 103 verse 10 says this about God. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far, hath he removed our transgressions from us. The east and the west will never meet. You go east and you're always going east. You have to stop and turn around to go west. And the east and the west never meet. And God has removed our sins, our transgressions from us. And we will never meet up with them again. We, will nev we never have to be haunted by them again. You can be delivered and freed and done with all of that. And it doesn't have to live in your conscience. I want to finish with this verse before we go on. Hebrews 9, verse 14. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The Bible says that Jesus has purged our conscience from dead works. We don't have to live with guilt. We don't have to feel like second-class citizens as Christians. That, well, you know, I'm saved and I'm forgiven, but the things that I did were so bad that, you know, God's kind of got me off in another category and I, I can't do certain things. No, we are pur our conscience is purged from sins. We are totally done, totally forgiven. I hope that you're walking in that truth and I hope that you are thankful not thankful for what your past is, but thankful that your past is forgiven. It's paid for. You don't have to do anything else to redeem the past. Wonderful thing. So number one, our past is paid for. Number two, our present has a purpose. There's a wonderful purpose that God has given us as Christians. And by the way, there are so many people in the world that lack a purpose. They're out there searching they don't know why they're here. They don't know what they're here for, what they're supposed to be doing in life. Life has no meaning. There's an emptiness. Many people tend towards suicide because of feeling unloved and alone and aimless in life. But as Christians, we should never go that direction. A Christian walking in the Spirit of God will never contemplate taking his life because he knows that he has been forgiven, and right now, he has a reason for living, a wonderful purpose in life. And as uh, Christians, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and try to come up with a purpose. There are a lot of Christians who are doing this, or trying to find some new purpose that no one's ever come up with before. But we don't have to come up with a reason that life is worth living. God tells us why life is worth living, and it all revolves around him. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 1, verses 20 and 21. He says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
That was Paul's purpose in life. He says, for to me, to live is Christ. And to die is even better, to die is gain. So what does he mean? What does it mean that to live is Christ? The previous verse shows it. It says that Christ shall be magnified in my body. The purpose that we have as Christians, and for me to say that Christ is my life, that to live is Christ, means that we are to magnify Christ out in the world wherever we go, no matter what it may be. Whether we are tortured, imprisoned, whether we are respected, whether we are honored, that we are to magnify and show the world how wonderful Jesus is. That's the purpose of the Christian life, to know Christ and to make him known, to magnify him out in the world so that they can, in turn, also come to have their past forgiven and come to have a purpose in life. Where our purpose is to show the world they can have a purpose. It's a cycle. It's a torch that we are to pass on a baton. And the purpose that we have is to show the world how wonderful Jesus is. If we're going to do this, we need to get in God's word and know for ourselves how wonderful he is. For all that he has done for us, he's wonderful. And just for who he is, he is wonderful. Jesus is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He can do anything. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He has given us gifts and blessings and laid down his life and salvation. He guides us. He directs us. He comforts us. And this is what we're to show the world. Allow Jesus to be magnified in your own mind and then go out and show that to the world. That is the purpose of life. And it's a purpose bigger than you and me. It's a purpose bigger than making money or gathering a certain amount of friends or having power and influence in the world. All of those things will fade, but Jesus is forever, and our purpose, as long as we're here, is to show the world how wonderful Jesus is, to magnify Jesus in the world. Another word the Bible uses is that we are ambassadors of God. And listen to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. It says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And so we go out and we show the world how wonderful Jesus is, and we do this on the behalf of Jesus. We represent him to the world. An ambassador's only job is to make his boss look good. It's to represent his boss in an accurate way. Now, we're not, it's not that we're ambassadors of someone who is wicked and cruel, and we're supposed to go and paint over that uh, conception and try to make him look better than he is. No, Jesus is wonderful, perfect. He's altogether lovely. And our goal is to show the reality. We're not trying to flatter Jesus before the world. We're trying to show the reality of who he is to the world. We are ambassadors. No matter how we do it, we're ambassadors. You and I are either wonderful ambassadors or poor ambassadors for Jesus, but we're all ambassadors. We all represent Jesus to the world for better or worse. So we need to do it better. We need to get it right. We need to live holy lives so they can see what God is like, so that they can see what is possible in their own lives. But this should be our goal. What am I here for? Why is my life worth living? Because my life is more than me. And by the way, uh, so many Christians go here that your life is worth living because of you. You, know, you are loved. You are special. No, life is not to revolve around us. For to me to live, Paul doesn't say for, for to me to live is me. Uh, my self-esteem, uh, how people think well of me. No, for to me to live is Christ. And that's a wonderful purpose. I hope that we are thankful for that purpose, that we get to come out of the small little ship that's us, and we get to get in, into the big ocean liner, the, the ship that is bigger than our lives of Jesus. We get to be on his team, called into his kingdom, into his realm to do his bidding. That's a wonderful purpose that we have. And yes, all that is true. We are loved more than we can imagine. But he's loved us and brought us in so that we can serve him and help him. And number three, our future. Not only is our past wonderful because it's been paid for and forgiven, not only is our present wonderful because we have a purpose, but our future is perfect. We have a perfect future. And by the word future here, we're primarily talking about 
all of eternity, a future that starts when we die. Now, there is a future that is before we die, and I hope that you and I have wonderful and long futures. But what we're going to focus on here today is a future that, that never ends. It has a beginning when we die. Here's what, uh, again, Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He says, life is awesome. This is the uh, Daniel Piggott paraphrase version here. Life is awesome, and dying is awesomer. That's what he says. It's even better. For to me to live, it's Christ. You can't improve on that. And yet you can through death. To die is, is even better. It's gain. As Christians, we know what is happening immediately after our death. In a nutshell, what happens is that we're going to go and be with Jesus, and we're going to be like him, and we're going to be there for all of eternity with no problems. I want to read some verses that kind of break these down and talk about it. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body in death is immediately to be present with Jesus. Can you say that you are willing to die? We're not talking about a weirdo or someone that's so sad he wants to commit suicide. But we don't fear death. We don't run away from it. We are willing to die when it's God's time because we are absent from the body and immediately present with the Lord. When you die, you will be with Jesus. That's a future to be thankful for. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 talks about when Jesus comes back. Some people will die before Jesus comes back. Some people will be alive when he comes back. Either way, we'll be with him forever. Look what it says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So if, if we die before Jesus comes back, we'll be the first to see him. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Listen to how the verse ends. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's your future if you're saved. You will be with the Lord and not just with him, with him forever. It will never end. And not only will you be with him, but you will be like him. Listen to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's going to be a day we're going to be given a glorified body that is able to look on the glory. Right now, we can't look on the glory of Jesus. Uh, God said to Moses, no man can see me and live. Right now, we would die. We would disintegrate, maybe. But we're going to be fitted. We're going to be outfitted with glorified bodies one day that can handle the brightness and glory of Jesus. And when we're given those and we look on him, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be sinless. We're going to drop our sin nature. We're going to drop all of our desires and lusts that are inordinate, that are sinful. And we're going to be not only with Jesus forever, but we will be like him forever. And not only that, but we're not going to be with Jesus and like Jesus in a fallen world. We're going to be in a perfect world where there's going to be no more sin and no more problems. The world of heaven. It talks about it in Revelation 21 verses 3 and 4. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. By the way, that's one of the key things that makes heaven, heaven. Yes, that, we're, that it's a sinless world. But the greatest thing about heaven is that we're with God. That's the worst thing about hell, is that they're separated from the presence of God forever. So it says, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Almost everything, in fact, we could probably say on an experiential level, everything that defines this life is imperfect, except for the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God that's in us. But everything else about the human experience, it's all imperfect. It's all going to be done away 
It will be gone. The former things are passed away. There's going to be no more pain or sorrow or crying or death. And that's going to be our state for all eternity with Jesus, like him, in a perfect world uh, with no more problems. And this perfect future is also sure. It is a secure thing that there's no doubt There's no way that this could possibly be turned or or come away. Listen to Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. Which, by the way, because it can never be taken away, we don't have to fear death. Unbelievers, they're unsure about their future. They're afraid of what's going to be after death, and so they fear death. The Bible talks about it, Hebrews 2.14. For as much then... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The Bible says there's a great bondage that's holding unbelievers, that the devil, it says he has the power of death, And what that means is he holds the concept of death over unbelievers as something to be feared. It says because of that, they were through fear of death all their lifetime subject to bondage. But we as Christians, we don't fear death because we know what's on the other side and we welcome it. We are confident to be able to stand before God and have that eternity that is secure and that is sure. Have you ever been at an airport and seen someone that was waiting for a flight, but he didn't have secure tickets. He was on standby. He didn't know for sure. Here's what they do. They say, well, we got kind of a full plane, but if somebody doesn't show up, if there's a cancellation or something like this, if a seat opens up, then you'll be the first on. Or sometimes they say, you're not even first. We've got a line. We've got six or seven people. But if we can get you on there, we'll get you on there. And this person, they have to make this flight, something really important. Maybe they need to be there to catch a funeral or to watch a game, whatever it may be. But they they need this flight, and they're pacing back and forth, and they're nervous. They keep checking in at the counter. Anything open yet? Anything open yet? And they're, they're nervous. They're full of anxiety. That is where so many unbelievers are. They go through life, and they have no idea what to think about their future. Am I going to make it? Am I going to survive? What will be after? And they're, they're filled with terror and they're in bondage. As Christians, we can be thankful for our future because it's perfect and because it is secure. Nothing can ever take it away from us. And by the way, on this side of heaven, our future is also bright. doesn't mean that we're going to have smooth sailing, no problems. But we have promises that God's going to provide for all of our needs. He's going to direct us whenever we need direction. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. God will provide all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So if you're sitting on your couch tomorrow, you're sitting at the Thanksgiving table, eating that turkey, getting ready for your trip to fan food coma, uh, and you're wondering, what do I have to be thankful for? We have so much, but we can start with this. Your past is forgiven by God. It's paid for. Your future, your your present has a purpose. You don't have to go through life aimlessly. You get to represent and live for the King of Kings and your future is perfect. Nothing could ever be better than the future that you have been promised and given by God. I hope that you're thankful to God this Thanksgiving season. We can thank other people. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. But every good gift comes from God. And let's thank God and and live lives that show the world how wonderful he is. Let's magnify Christ to the world. Let's close together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for giving us all of these things that we've just discussed for free. We didn't do anything to earn these things. They were freely given to us by a wonderful Savior. Thank you. The greatest gift that we've ever been given was when Jesus came. You call it the unspeakable gift. You came and laid down your life as a ransom for us to pay for our sins so we would not have to spend forever in hell. I pray that if there's anyone watching that doesn't know for sure they're on their way to heaven, that even today would be the day they call on the name of the Lord. They admit they're sinners. They admit they believe that they don't deserve heaven, only hell. But you died so that they could be forgiven. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
for us as believers, help us to not murmur and complain about anything because you've ordained all things to happen. Help us to be thankful. Help us to find the redeeming qualities in all of our difficulties. Help us to be thankful for our past being forgiven, for our present and for our future. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope that you enjoy uh, the Thanksgiving meal. Maybe you have a special meal. I hope you enjoy time with family or friends and, and fellowship with your Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know at flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven. If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com slash give. Thank you and God bless you.